Welcome to Dietetics After Dark, your source for food-related crime, scandal, and fraud. Hey, Becca. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm well as well. What's new this week? What is new this week? Honestly, a lot of Taylor Swift. A little bit of Christmas present wrapping Mm -hmm. and some baking. I feel like we may be living the same life. (laughs) Yeah, I think I think a lot of people are living that life right now. Yeah. How do do you find the the new T-Swift? New T-Swift. I like it. Yeah, it's good. I'm into it. Yep. She's good. I think I need to listen to it a couple more times as I've only listened to it approximately 15. So (laughs) I need to really, you know, get a good feel for it. I actually went on a road trip with Jeff and we had a two hour car ride each way. And he reluctantly listened to it and then kept having the song stuck in his head. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's a win in my book because he's like not down to listen. But that's what I did with folklore as well as I listened to it about 50 times and then I was obsessed with it. So I feel like that's all he's got to do. And then he'll be a true T-Swift fan. (laughs) Totally. (laughs) In in better news, the vaccine Mm -hmm. did come out this past week. Yeah. Yay. And I was reading today that in Canada, by September 2021, every Canadian that wants it should be able to get it. September 2021. That's amazing. Just 10 more months. (laughs) 10 more months. Honestly, but to have an end date on it feels really good. Yeah. I don't know how solid that end date is. It might might change a bit, but um, it's nice to have a date to look forward to. Yeah, it really is. And what else did we do this week that was so exciting? We actually did it today. Extra cheese. Extra cheese. So we released our first mini episode to keep you going between these big episodes. So you should have Dietetics After Dark content every single week, Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is exciting. Yeah, these long form episodes, they do take quite a bit of time. They're very labor intensive. So Mm -hmm. we decided we do something small in the weeks between. So if you haven't checked that out yet, do it. Yeah. (laughs) And we have a cool new song for it. Yeah. So check out our cool new theme song. Cool new song. Today, we are going to cover the history of sugar. And then Mm -hmm. I'm going to do a deep dive into the 1960s Harvard study that changed the portrayal of sugar and fat for the food industry and the mind of minds of consumers everywhere. So Ooh. I'm going to then go into like a couple sneaky things that I found out through my research because there's definitely some scandal there. But this episode isn't necessarily as crimey, crimey. as the other ones were, yeah. but it's still very interesting and it still has a lot of moments of like cringeworthy moments. Totally. Mm-hmm. And a lo- like my part has a lot of interesting Oh my gosh, like we could do multiple episodes on sugar. And I found like while I was researching, I was craving sweet things. (laughs) Like just thinking about sugar, it activated my sweet tooth. That's for sure. The information in this podcast is for entertainment purposes only. If you're interested in medical nutrition therapy or personalized nutrition advice, please talk to a registered dietitian in your area. All the citations and relevant links for anything mentioned in this episode will be in our show notes. This podcast may contain coarse language and mature subject matter. Listener discretion is advised. This is an independently produced podcast. If you could rate, review, and subscribe, that would really help us out, and we will be forever grateful. Okay, so I guess I'll start off telling you about the wonderfully divisive product that everyone loves to hate, sugar. It's been called addictive which isn't exactly true, but it does activate a reward circuit in our brain by triggering dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter that makes us feel good. But that's why people think it's addictive because it activates like the same pleasure centers as something like drugs would. And sugar has also been blamed for everything from obesity and some non-communicable diseases to hyperactivity in children and poor dental health. So it's got a bit of a bad rep. Um, But humans also love sugar, at least the taste of it. So we have over 10,000 taste buds, and each one of them has receptors for sweetness. 
Most scientists think that we evolved to prefer and actually seek out sweeter foods because from a survival standpoint, it helps us identify foods that are safe and energy dense. Plus, human breast milk is quite sweet. So about 40% of the calories in human breast milk come from a form of sugar called maltose, right? which is just two molecules of glucose bound together. So I remember in the Nutrition Through the Lifespan course, mm -hmm. and I remember learning about this exact topic, and they, I, I feel like in my brain, I don't know if this is accurate, but I feel like we were taught that a lot of the sweet taste receptors, like I know you're saying that they're all over the mouth, but a lot of them mm -hmm. are right at the tip of the mouth just because of how when you go to breastfeed, that's like the first thing that touches. Yeah. I remember hearing that too. I think the ones at the tip of the mouth are sweeter. Okay. So each taste bud has thousands of different receptors. Uh, fact check that. Nice try, Sarah. Each taste bud only has between 50 and 100 receptor cells, and the average adult has between 2,000 and 8,000 taste buds. And despite what we learned in food science, it's not actually true that there are certain areas of the tongue responsible for different taste sensations. Some areas might be slightly more sensitive to sweet, bitter, salty, sour, and umami sensations. But because each taste bud has sweet receptors, you can taste sweetness anywhere on your tongue. So, yes, breast milk has a lot of maltose, which is two molecules of glucose. So, a quick carbohydrate lesson. Today, we're going to be talking mostly about classic table sugar. So the white crystallized sugar that we put in everything from baked goods to processed foods. And this form of sugar has been linked to all sorts of health concerns and can raise blood sugar very quickly after consumption. But there are a wide variety of different types of sugars that occur naturally in foods called the simple carbohydrates. This is all coming back to you. Yeah, I actually, I mentioned fructose later on, so I'm curious to know what you're going to say about it. <laughs> Not too much, to be honest. <laughs> so these are shorter chains of sugar molecules that are called the mono and disaccharides. And some of the most common ones, like Becca just said, we've got fructose, glucose, maltose, galactose, lactose, sucrose. And these occur naturally in fruits, vegetables, grains, and dairy products. And they are an excellent source of energy and nutrition. So these simple carbohydrates are our body's most efficient source of energy because they're, di they're easily digested into the ultimate simple carbohydrate, which is glucose. Mm -hmm. So when we eat polysaccharides, disaccharides in our food, they're broken down into glucose through digestion, and then they're shuttled through a process called glycolysis, which breaks down glucose and gives us ATP that our body can use for energy. It's all coming screaming back to me. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to? Do you want to just quickly recap the citric acid? No, cycle I for absolutely us? do not. <laughs> Leave me out of this. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I think I've learned the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle twenty times throughout because my first degree was biology too, <laughs> biology and then nutrition. So I learned it in so many courses, and I just I learn it, and then it all leaves my yeah. head. It's so important, but I could care less. <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay. So when we consume all these food sources, whole food sources of simple carbohydrates, we're also consuming fiber and vitamins and minerals, and they're super nutritious. But when we talk about added sugar or table sugar, it's pure, isolated, and refined sucrose, which means that it only provides energy or kilocalories. And so this is why you might have heard people referring to added sugar as empty calories, because you're not actually getting any macro or micronutrients, it's just pure sucrose. So just pure energy, really. So as the food system has become increasingly industrialized over the past couple centuries, sugar has played a very important role as a preservative, a texture modifier, a fermentation substrate, a flavoring agent, a coloring agent, and of course, as a sweetener. So it's often added to food to help achieve bliss point which is the perfect balance of salt, sugar, and fat, where the flavors combine to make food taste really, really, really good. So classic white refined sugar or table sugar, which I'm just going to call sugar from mm -hmm. now on, comes from either sugar cane or sugar beets. Both crops give us the exact same end product. So it's 100% sucrose mm -hmm. and they look identical, but they come from two totally different crops. The crops are harvested, chopped up, 
boiled to extract all the sucrose. And then you're left with a really sweet syrupy liquid that gets purified, crystallized, dried, and packaged. Something interesting I learned while researching this is that during the purification process, which basically takes sugar from a brown color to a white color, and it's only done for sugar cane. Okay. Um, they usually use or, or typically historically used to use animal bone char. So they would take animal bones, burn them until all that was left was the charcoal carbon ash, mm-hmm. and then use that to filter the sugar. So I just thought that was oh. interesting. And I think, you know, a lot of people would think it's a, a vegan product or a vegan friendly product. And um, it may not be. Okay, I've also heard that about some beer as well, yeah. where they'll use like fish fish parts fish to make the filtering or something like that. Yeah, for the filtering mechanism for beer. So yeah. there's certain beers that aren't vegan either, which it's a really interesting process. I'd actually like really like to see how this is done, but yeah. definitely something to watch out for if you're vegan. Yeah, it's interesting. And there's no traces of the bone char in sugar. Like it's it's actually a really it's also used to filter water. It's really effective because when they take, they're taking carbonate and compressing it, it literally looks like a tablet that would like be in a urinal, <laughs> but it's just completely black. It's all carbonate and then it attracts all the negative ions and filters it. I don't know. It's magic. Oh, science. So cool. I know. <laughs> so cool. All right. Where was I here? Okay. So the earliest records of sugar cultivation occurred nearly 10,000 years ago by indigenous peoples in New Guinea. And they primarily cultivated sugar cane for animal feed. They would also chew on sugar just to enjoy the sweet flavor. The earliest records of sugar manufacturing, so actually crystallizing the sugar and making it into a form similar to what we know today, originated in India about 2,000 years ago. And then it spread to the Middle East, the Mediterranean, and Egypt. And for centuries, sugar was a very expensive luxury and a bit of a status symbol. So at wealthy parties, feasts would include elaborate sugar sculptures, and wealthy guests would be given sugar to take home as gifts. And it was also used to sweeten bitter medicines, but it was definitely not widely consumed by the public. A spoonful of sugar. A spoonful of sugar. Okay, so the reason why sugar was so expensive is because at the time... Harvesting and processing sugar was incredibly labor intensive and there was a shortage of manpower. So, how did sugar transition from being a luxury item to a household commodity? In three words, Europe, colonization, and slavery. Mm. Yeah, bummer, real big bummer. Mm -hmm. So, it began when the Portuguese and the Spanish colonized and set up sugar plantations in Madeira, Porto Santo, and the Canary Islands. And these are all islands off the northwest coast of Africa, so right near Morocco. Okay. And these islands had the ideal climate for growing sugarcane, and they were inhabited by indigenous peoples that, um, to an entrepreneurial colonialist, could be enslaved. Mm. Yeah. So Christopher Columbus made a voyage to the Caribbean in 1493, and he made a pit stop in the Canary Islands to grab a seed cane, which is just a little stock of sugar cane that can be replanted. I'm sure he grabbed some road trip snacks as well. (laughs) And he brought sugar cane to an island called Hispaniola, which is actually Haiti and the Dominican Republic today. And by the early 16th century, he had established more sugar cane plantations in Puerto Rico, Jamaica, Cuba, and eventually Brazil. However, with the constant wars and the introduction of communicable disease, an estimated 80 to 90 percent of indigenous populations died off during the first century of colonization. So again, a shortage of manpower. This gets really rough. Oh, just no. a warning. OK. Um, I mean, it's not shocking, but no, I was I was expecting this, but it's never, never fun to hear about. Yeah. So the solution was exporting African slaves to Brazil. And this is the model that America eventually adopted as well. Sugar was actually called white gold as it fueled the growth of European nations. So they were becoming really very wealthy off of these sugar cane plantations. And sugar production did become huge in the southern United States. So by the mid-1800s, Louisiana alone was producing 25% of the world's sugar cane using the enslaved population. Mm. 
This is probably not surprising, but the labor required to work on these plantations was absolutely brutal. So around the clock work, undernourishment, and very low life expectancies were common among slaves working on the sugar plantations. And I, yeah, so I was, I made a note here that I think we could revisit the injustices of sugar agriculture uh, in another episode or a series of episodes because the human cost of harvesting sugar is still very high. So in Nicaragua and El Salvador, actually, there are some areas where sugar plantation workers have a life expectancy today of 46 years. And they often, so it's, it's a really well-established pattern. There's quite a few studies on it. They'll fall ill and die quite rapidly of chronic kidney disease after starting working at one of these plantations. Yeah, so I watched National Geographic's documentary and there was one community where almost 70% of the men have either stage one to five chronic kidney disease and they work at the plantations. Wow. So do, yeah. do you think that that's from consuming it or inhaling it or just being around it? So the leading theory, so there have been a lot of, quite a few studies done. Mm -hmm. And one study in particular showed that there was thought that it might be linked to um, pesticides or chemicals being used. Right agrochemicals. And the workers that were actually administering, I was spraying the fields and had the closest contact with the agrochemicals had the least rates of chronic kidney disease. Wow. So that, yeah, that was kind of squashed. And the leading theory currently is that it's chronic dehydration and heat stress. Oh, that's really. Yeah. Cause there's, they don't have access to shade, overworked, crazy long hours don't get mandatory breaks and are often subcontracted to avoid liability. Oh my God. That's so awful. Right. We definitely need to do yeah. like a, a full, full episode. episode, a couple episodes on that because there's definitely a lot of information there. Yes. And not just limited to sugar. Mm -hmm. I think we'd find things like this across a lot of agriculture. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's talk about sugar in Canada. The climate in Canada is not suitable for growing sugar cane, but we do produce some sugar beets in Alberta. Apparently, this really surprised me, per capita sugar consumption in Canada has not increased since the 1940s. What? Since the 1940s? Since the 1940s, huh. but it's like been steady, but it's not increasing. And that doesn't mean we're not consuming quite a bit, but yeah. The Canadian Community Health Survey from 2015 indicates that Canadians are getting nearly 20% of their daily energy from total sugars, with nearly 9% of that coming from added sugar, which is actually kind of reasonable. That's within the World Health Organization's recommendations for sugar consumption. Right. That's at the high end, but still. And this is probably because the amount of added sugar in the Canadian marketplace and in processed foods specifically has declined over mm. the past 20 years. And on average, in Canada, we have one-third less sugar in food products than in the U.S. Which is interesting because I'll touch on that yeah. a little bit. Will you? Yeah. Oh, cool. Okay. Exciting. And so the World Health Organization recommends limiting free sugar intake, so the added sugars during processing, to less than 10% of total energy consumption. So for a 2,000-calorie diet, for example... 200 calories would come from sugar, which works out to 50 grams per day or about 12 teaspoons. Doesn't that seem like so much? Mm -hmm. That is a lot. I can't imagine like lining up 12 teaspoons yeah. in front of me and then downing them. You know, that's totally. It seems, it seems unreasonable. Like <laughs> yeah. But what, so yeah, it seems like a ton, but there are a lot of sneaky added sugars in products like bread, pasta sauce, yogurt granola bars, things like that. So mm -hmm. it's actually not hard for your sugar intake to add up quite quickly. No, for sure. And then I just have a quick note before I wrap it up. So if you're looking to decrease your sugar intake, for example, you can check food labels for sugar, but it's more likely that it's going to be disguised under another name. So some things to watch out for if you're reading ingredient labels are anything ending in os. So galactose, maltose, sucrose, fructose, glucose molasses, honey, maple syrup, brown rice syrup, corn syrup, fruit juices, fruit juice concentrate, and honestly, the list goes on. So there's a lot of mm -hmm. names that sugar can be disguised behind. And that's it. That's your intro to sugar. That was great, Sarah. I honestly could not have asked for a better intro 
Perfect. to my section. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Because you perfectly complimented what I'm about to talk about. Oh, that's which exciting. Is the Harvard Sugar Study and how fat was involved as well. Mm. Okay. So are you ready for this, Sarah? Yeah. Let's hear it. Cool. Okay. One quick question before I do get into this. Okay. So how much do you know about the Harvard Sugar Study? And if anything, what are your initial thoughts? Okay. So I don't actually know a ton. I know that this is what I think. Okay. And I purposely didn't go into the research before this Mm -hmm. podcast. But I think that the sugar industry funded research to kind of villainize the fat industry and steer the health guidelines away from sugar. And it worked for a while. For a very, 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 very long time. Yeah. To the point where it's almost, it's almost embarrassing (laughs) that it went on for so long. And I mean, like, if you haven't heard of this scandal, you've likely been living under a rock for the last Mm -hmm. couple of years, or you were born in the last five years because this was huge. But again, like, I guess there have been things kind of that were uncovered previously to this, but it hasn't mm-hmm. really been since the last like five years that things have really started to come out about about this. And I don't know about you, but growing up in the 90s, I remember low fat foods oh my being gosh. all the rage. So like, yeah. like the low fat dressings, crackers. Salad dressings was huge. Salad dressings was massive. Even cheese, yogurts. Oh my gosh. Cheese. Yeah. I had a lot of those in my house. Low fat cheese is not good. It's not good. But yeah, with less fat, often comes more sugar Mm -hmm. to just to make up for that flavor or texture. So for instance, those low-fat salad dressings often did have a higher sugar content. Kind of like that bliss point, like they're compensating. Exactly. And and the bliss point, isn't it sugar to fat ratio? Like and salt, salt. Sugar, fat, salt. So it wasn't until recently, like literally within this last decade, that we started digging into some previous research on this topic. And it was found that, as you said, some of this foundational research done on sugar and fat was influenced by the sugar industry themselves. Mm. So the key resources that I used in my research include an article by the Associated Press called Sugar Industry Paid Scientists for Favorable Research Documents Revealed, And then some research by, this is the main study that was released in 2016. It's by Kearns, Schmidt, and Glantz called Mm -hmm. Sugar Industry and Coronary Heart Disease Research, a Historical Analysis of Internal Industry Documents. And then some other articles that I uh, stumbled across were from Time Magazine, uh, and then there were a couple others, but you can find all of those in in the show notes. I just wanted to give the main two a shout out there. I'm excited to learn about this. Like It was honestly fascinating. I'll be honest, at first, I was like, okay, this is going to be a boring episode. And I was even like complaining to Dan about it. Like, I don't even know what I'm going to talk about. And then I sat down for five minutes and started getting into it. And I was like, there is so much here. Cool. Okay. <sighs> so we're going to start at the very beginning. Well, it's like not the very, very beginning because you started with like a very the very invention beginning. of sugar. <laughs> but I feel like I kind of pivot off in 1964, which you didn't really talk about. Nope. So I feel like it was the perfect segue. So we're in 1964. It's post-World War II, and some research came out linking sugar to heart disease, and the sugar industry is taking a little bit of a hit. So they're looking to do some damage control, and the Sugar Research Foundation, which is now called the Sugar Association, launched a campaign to address these claims and the negative impact that they were having on sugar sales. So I'm going to quickly read you the copy from one sugar advertisement that I found from Time Magazine in 1964. I love old advertisements. This first one has a happy-looking child on it with pigtails, and she's roller skating. And here's what it says. So after practicing baton twirling, Judy climbed the apple tree to rescue the cat, skated to the store for bobby pins. Now she's home from dancing class. She needs a sugarless, go-less soft drink like a kangaroo needs a baby buggy. What are little girls made of? Sugar for energy. Sugar's got what it takes, 18 calories per teaspoon, and it's all energy. Okay, well, it is all energy. Yeah, technically that last line is true. 
<laughs> like a kangaroo needs a baby buggy. I was like, I don't understand. I read it a few times and then I was like, oh, yeah, I, I, I don't think it's supposed to make sense. So it's saying that this child needs a sugary soft drink Mm -hmm. for energy. They're promoting the consumption of sugar to boost energy levels in children. Right. And I feel like knowing what we know about sugar now, this is extremely problematic because you're Mm -hmm. not even promoting it to the children, but you're promoting it to the parents as though it's it's healthy. It's going to let get your child through the day. For sure. This is the Mm -hmm. right decision to make for your child. Exactly. Is what they're saying. Mm -hmm. So in 1965, while marketing campaigns like this took place, the Sugar Association, which is what I'll call them throughout this because that's the, the current name of the association, they also approved something that they called Project 226. And it was in this project that involved paying the equivalent of about $50,000 USD to Harvard researchers to review the current literature on sugar and fat and to produce some new and improved research. Mm. The Sugar Association set the objective of the research, and that objective was to look at the role that fat and carbohydrates play in heart disease. So they're just lining this up perfectly for themselves. Uh, Hey, sugar, I have news for you. (laughs) You are a carbohydrate. No, that's the thing. They're recognizing themselves as carbohydrates, but they're placing themselves against fat. Against fat. Okay, okay, sorry. Mm -hmm. So they're like, please, will you look at the, like, will you compare and contrast for us? Got it. So they provided some articles to include in this research, and they also received drafts of the findings throughout the research process. In 1967, the Harvard article was published by the New England Journal of Medicine, And the three authors were made up of MDs and PhDs, so they were very credible players in terms of science. The research indicated that in order to prevent heart disease, only two dietary interventions were necessary, reducing cholesterol and reducing saturated fats. And so there's a couple issues here, and I'll number them off for you. Number one, the sugar industry's role and associated funding were not published with the research. Yeah, that's an issue. It is an issue, but it wasn't until 1984 that the journal requested disclosures regarding funding. Right. technically, at this time, by keeping this information concealed, they weren't doing anything wrong. I'm curious to know what best practice was at the time. So even if it wasn't, like, required for you to disclose, was everyone disclosing? Like, was it weird to be like, let's leave this out? Or was it not even standard at the time to disclose? Fun. So I don't think that it was standard, and I'll, I'll look into this. I'll fact check it if, it if it's not. But, like, this would definitely not fly now. But no. even today, like, at the same time, today there's still – there are standards, but the standards don't specify what the role of the funder is. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? So they – will provide who is funding the research project, but they don't necessarily have to specify what type of role they had in the research. Right. Yeah. They don't have to say sugar, the sugar association funded this and they requested check-ins with the results throughout. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's still a fuzzy area today. Yeah. But that's, that's an issue just because that wouldn't, that wouldn't fly today. Um, They weren't technically doing anything wrong, but it's still, it's still an issue because it kind of led us down the wrong path. Number two. To this day, there is still no appreciable relationship between dietary cholesterol and heart disease. However, it is recommended to limit the amount of saturated fat in the diet. So they did get that part right to some degree. And I do feel like cholesterol and heart disease, that combo, Mm -hmm. is one that has been argued for decades. So I just wanted to quickly break down what that means just so that it makes a little bit more sense. Um, So cholesterol is a waxy substance and it's actually a steroid. And for those of you who are science brains out there, you likely know that steroids are actually a part of the lipid family tree. So they are a type of fat. And this means that they're insoluble in water. So they don't, they don't dissolve in water. And this is why having a high blood cholesterol can be dangerous, as it might float around in your arteries, potentially leading to plaque buildup. And this might eventually limit the amount of blood going to the rest of your body, which could present some problems. However, cholesterol is also 100% necessary for us to stay alive as it creates the structural membranes around every single cell in our body. Because it's so essential to our being, our bodies actually create it themselves. So this is why it's also found in animal products. Their bodies create it to survive too. So by eating animal products, you are eating their cholesterol. And I know that it would make sense if 
eating cholesterol raised your blood cholesterol, but it's really mm -hmm. just not that simple uh, because your body does highly regulate the amount of cholesterol that it has in it. So if you eat more cholesterol, your body will produce mm -hmm. less. And if you eat less cholesterol, your body will produce so cool. more. It's so it is. Our so bodies cool. are so cool. They're fascinating, really. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I do know that this could be extremely frustrating for somebody who has high blood cholesterol. Mm -hmm. But the way to lower it just hasn't been proven through a decrease in dietary cholesterol. Mm -hmm. So things like lifestyle changes, um, so like exercise and consuming cholesterol-lowering foods have actually been way more effective in, in reducing high cholesterol, or sorry, high blood cholesterol. Yeah. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. so interesting. Yeah, so that's your crash course in cholesterol. <laughs> uh, and you can see that research like this could confuse a lot of people because it was just wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, and this includes scientists and dietitians because it did change the recommendations and consumer buying habits for many years. Yeah, I can totally see because not only was it being reported as fact, but it also it logically makes sense that reducing your dietary cholesterol would impact your blood cholesterol. Mm -hmm. But that's not the case. No, it absolutely does make sense. And I, I like when you think about the scope of this study, like it didn't just affect like sugar and fat sales and whatnot, but think about eggs. I feel like eggs have had it. Eggs got a bad rep. Mm -hmm. And they're amazing. I love eggs. I do too. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Like eating just egg whites to me is <laughs> an atrocity. I feel the same way. I'm all yeah. about the yolk. All about the yolk. <laughs> okay. So I guess I was numbering off issues with this research <laughs> before I went on that tangent. So the third issue here is that while the association is not fully understood, there is a link between sugar and an increased risk of heart disease. So by blaming fat for heart health issues, the sugar association was throwing the food industry and consumers off their scents. Yeah. And also research. Because yeah. if this association is still not fully understood, that could be because we lost four decades to blaming another nutrient. Absolutely. <sighs> yeah, it's frustrating looking back, isn't it? It is. <laughs> Hindsight is 2020. Just about to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait till 2021 so we can. Oh, really say yes. It. <laughs> Hindsight. Oh, my goodness. That'll be amazing. I know. <laughs> okay. So. Beyond this study, the sugar industry played into the sugar versus fat debate with their marketing campaigns, and you can tell that they used evidence similar to the results found in this study to make their claims. Since there really is no association advocating for dietary fat, since fat is found all over the place, there was really no notable rebuttal to this. It was essentially scientists versus the industry and media. And in many cases, scientists trusted these published results as well. Okay, so I have some more examples of sugar advertisements from the 60s and 70s for you. These were honestly so much fun to find because it's maddening that these were even allowed to be published. Oh my gosh. Okay, so it's a woman smiling and she's holding a cup and it looks like it's, it probably has like, I'm guessing pop or soda in it. Yeah, it looks like Pepsi. And it says, get ready for the fat time of day. I hate it already. <laughs> The sugar in a soft drink now can save me a lot of calories later. Okay. That doesn't even make sense. No. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't. But they make an interesting claim here that, like, I feel like if you didn't have the background knowledge, you might buy into it. So it continues. Anytime you allow yourself to get ravenous, you're in trouble. That's the fat time of day when your apostat is turned up and you're likely to overeat. What's an apostat? Your thermostat for your appetite? Yes. It's oh super gosh. clever. <laughs> By snacking on something sweet shortly before mealtime, you turn your apostat down. The sugar in a couple of cookies or a small dish of ice cream can turn it down almost immediately. You're able to get past the fat time of day because your appetite is down and your energy is up. Okay, yes, having a snack will stop you from feeling hungry. Yes. So that's that's a fair claim. It doesn't need to be a super sugar-laden food. Okay, also sugar, only 18 calories per teaspoon. And it's yes. all energy. Yeah, so they're really, they are using diet culture here. Oh, yeah. To sell sugar. They're trying to make it seem like it's like the next 
big thing everybody's going to be doing. The time of day, which is they're basically just referring to a time of day when you get hungry. Yes. And they're calling Lunch that the time, fat time snack of time. day. Mm-hmm. Oh. Okay, <gasps> Sarah, this next one is even worse. Oh, stop. If you can believe it. No, I can't. Okay. Yeah, okay, gonna, I can. I see the title. Oh, my it's gosh. A bit, it's a bit lengthy, so I'll prepare you for that. But um, I actually cropped the image here because it was massive, but it was just like a big glass of Coke okay. on the front with a straw in it. And it reads, if sugar is so fattening, how come so many kids are thin? Next time you pass a bunch of kids, take a look. Kids <laughs> eat and drink more things made of sugar than anybody. But how many fat kids do you see? I'm sorry. This is it's so yeah, bad. It's, it's hard to read because it's so ridiculous. The fact is, if you constantly take in more food than your body needs, you'll probably get fat. If you eat a balanced diet in moderation, you probably won't. And sugar in moderation has a place in a balanced diet. For kids, eating or drinking something with sugar in it can mean a new supply of body fuel, fuel that can be used in not too many minutes. There's a useful psychological effect too, as you were saying, Sarah. The good natural sweetness of sugar is like a little reward that promotes a sense of satisfaction and well-being. The good thing is good nutrition comes from a balanced diet, and a balanced diet means the right amounts and right kinds of protein, vitamins, minerals, fats, and carbohydrates. Now, what's one important carbohydrate? Sugar. Wow. So I like the messaging around balanced, balanced Mm -hmm. diet. That's, I support that. And I do think (sighs) it's troublesome, eh? Especially that first, the first little, uh, how many fat kids do you see? Like Mm -hmm. using that messaging is just toxic. And yeah, for kids eating or drinking something with sugar in it can be a new supply of body fuel. So can pretty much any thing that you eat or drink. Yeah. Try an apple. Try it truly anything that has any other nutrient in it than just plain energy. Mm -hmm. Cheese and crackers. Anything you eat has energy. The great thing about a lot of things is that they have energy and other things that our body can use. Yeah. Fat, protein, vitamin, minerals. But when it's just straight sugar, oh my gosh. And targeting, like bringing kids into the equation, I do not like this ad, obviously. Yeah, I found this one very shocking, which is why I saved it for last. Yes, thanks. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So yeah, they're kind of promoting sugar like it's some type of health product. Yeah, but it can. So like this whole episode, I don't want to be villainizing sugar because you can no. eat some sugar and have a healthy diet. Absolutely. And I, I will mention that later on. Like this isn't, this really, really isn't to vilify sugar. Yeah. But it is looking at what sugar did to vilify fat. Mm -hmm. to promote sales. Yeah. So we're just trying to expose everything here. But yes, truth of the matter is we do need carbohydrates. So what they're saying there is true. All of our cells use glucose as their main form of energy, either used right away or stored for later. And I know you were mentioning glucose earlier. Mm -hmm. Uh, And when sugar or sucrose is digested, it breaks down into both fructose and glucose. So yes, it gives us that quick source of energy. But whereas glucose can be used as energy by all of the body's cells, fructose is almost entirely metabolized in the liver. So one of the end products of this metabolic process are triglycerides, which are a type of fat. And if these triglycerides build up in the liver, it can lead to what's called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And if these triglycerides are released into the bloodstream, they may contribute to more plaque in the arteries. So high blood sugar overall, it can also contribute to insulin resistance, which is a precursor to type 2 diabetes. So again, not to vilify sugar, but they missed out on exposing what the harms of sugar could potentially be if Mm -hmm. consumed in excess over time. And villainized fat and a breakdown product of sugar, of fructose is a fat, a form of fat. Yes. That's interesting. Did you know fructose is sweeter tasting than glucose? I actually have heard that. Yes. I found that in my research. I thought it was cool. <laughs> That's why honey tastes sweeter than sugar. Because oh, honey is I guess that makes sense. a mix of fructose. We'll fact check. 
According to the Honey Bee Center, honey is made up of 38% fructose, 31% glucose, 17% water, and 7% maltose, and has smaller amounts of trisaccharides, sucrose, minerals, vitamins, and enzymes. That's so interesting. Yeah. I mean, the moral of the story always is that moderation is key. So Mm -hmm. yeah, keep that in mind. Okay. Well, the rest of the world didn't really question this research until later on. I mean, most of this did come out in 2016, so about four years ago. There was one scientist who was trying to warn the general public about sugar right from the get-go, and that's John Yudkin. He was a, a physiologist and nutritionist from the 40s to the 1980s, and he wrote several books on sugar's links to obesity and heart disease. Hmm. Yet no one really was willing to listen to him, which is super unfortunate because he passed away in the 90s and he just, he didn't really get to see the world's dietary patterns change based on some of his initial claims. Aww. And the reason, I wasn't, I wasn't sure if I was going to bring this up, but I think I will. The reason he was kind of pushed off to the side was because there were two different schools of thought. So there was anti-sugar, which is Yudkin, And then there was the Mm anti-fat and more specifically anti-saturated fat, but generally anti-fat. And the main, like the key player there was Ansel Keys. Mm -hmm. Have you heard that name before? Yes, definitely. Yes. His um, starvation study. Yep. So interesting. Yeah. So he wasn't the most ethical scientist. And as you said, he did those starvation studies. But it was groundbreaking. Groundbreaking. And they even interview. Okay, I'll describe it first and then I'll get into it. (laughs) But essentially, there are these studies that were done during the end of World War II. And they took 36 otherwise healthy individuals and essentially starved them. So they deprived them of food just Mm -hmm. to see what their reaction was to starvation, but also to refeeding. So it was kind of the birth of what we know today as refeeding syndrome. Yeah. And that's, that's like a metabolic disturbance. So when you're, you go from a, a state of deprivation to being nourished again, it's just some, some differences that happen in your body because it, it's not as easy as just starting to eat normally again. Yeah. And it can be very serious. Like people die from refeeding syndrome. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think like when you think of someone starving, you'd think that they would just want to eat everything or, you know, if you think of like a famine situation, it can actually be dangerous to then like refeed yourself very quickly. Absolutely. And some of the like effects of the study were things like depression, hysteria, uh, hypochondriasis, which (laughs) quite literally is, it's being like a hypochondriac. Oh, okay. So it's just like paranoia. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, edema, self-mutilation. And then there was actually one instance where a man actually chopped off three of his fingers with an (gasps) ax. Oh, I didn't know that. He wasn't sure. I know it's crazy. He wasn't sure if he had done it intentionally or accidentally just because he was so out of it. But anyways, that's kind of just an aside. But Ansel Keys was one of the key players in discrediting Yudkin's work. So he was anti-fat. Okay. And then Yadkin was anti-sugar. So they kind of silenced this other scientist, which is just super unfortunate because he did make some really good claims. Mm-hmm. Let's fast forward to 2016 when some researchers, including Kristen Kierens, a former dentist, released a paper for JAMA Internal Medicine, and it contained 31 pages of correspondence between one of the Harvard researchers and the Sugar Association from the 1960s. Wow. How did she get that? I'm not quite sure. That's cool. I actually couldn't even get into the full article. It wasn't on our um, university database. Yeah. And I couldn't find it for free anywhere. So I took as much from the abstract that I could. Y- interesting. I feel like I'm picturing like a, a vigilante dentist that's just so frustrated with all the cavities mm-hmm. and, <laughs> and getting like the ultimate revenge. Absolutely. And she, she like, uncovered a lot more stuff. It wasn't just, it went beyond cavities. <laughs> but yeah, so these communications back and forth, they did reveal that there was a little bit of a cover-up going on and that the sugar industry also tried to counter other research that indicated links to other health issues such as diabetes. 
So following this 2016 paper being published, the Sugar Association did make a statement that they should have exercised greater transparency in all of their research activities, but that disclosures weren't commonplace then. So I guess that does kind of answer the question right. before. Yeah. They also stated that JAMA, the JAMA authors were attempting to reframe historical occurrences. So they just weren't really owning up to anything. They're just saying like, why do you keep bringing up the past? Yeah, and you're spitting it. Mm -hmm. However, this paper, as we know, was pivotal in the food industry and in reframing what constitutes a healthy diet. As we know, research plays a fundamental role in literally everything that we know about nutrition and science. It impacts what's reported in the news, it guides future research, and it also sets the stage for new trends and marketing strategies. Mm -hmm. In Harvard University, they were a reputable source then, and they're a reputable source they now. Are. So yeah. yeah, exactly. So for years, healthcare professionals use this initial research in their practice, reducing cholesterol and saturated fat to prevent heart disease. And they did kind of leave sugar out of the equation for a while as well. And while they're, they were right about saturated fat, it skewed our perceptions of both cholesterol and sugar in a way that some people still argue about their points to this day. Mm -hmm. But I do think that most consumers are finally starting to make some peace with the fact that we were lied to for so many years and take into consideration the benefits of healthy fats, like specifically unsaturated fats and things like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But- it would be silly of us to think that this was the only instance of deception on the part of the sugar industry. Mm -hmm. So in the 1960s and 70s, the sugar industry also had influence over the U.S. National Institute of Dental Research and shifted the focus from sugar intake as a culprit of cavities. To what? <laughs> I think they just shifted it to something else. I don't <laughs> what else is there? <laughs> not flossing, not brushing. <sighs> That's funny. Okay, so the scientific director of the institute at the time, so like I think it was in the 70s, mm -hmm. he was even recorded saying that on logical grounds and good evidence, if we could eliminate the consumption of sucrose, we could eliminate the problem being wow. cavities. We are realists, however, and we recognize the value of sucrose in nutrition. Mm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Who said yeah, that? So that was the head of the Dental Association? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So there was a little corruption all over the place. Wow. In this story. Yeah. And then the Sugar Association, they did comment on a recent publication of these findings in the Times, so in 2015. And they said, it is challenging for the current Sugar Association staff to comment directly on documents and events that allegedly occurred before and during Richard Nixon's presidency, given the staff has changed entirely since the 1970s. However, we are confused as to the relevance of attempts to dredge up history when decades of modern science has provided answers regarding the role of diet and pathogenesis of dental caries. A combined approach of reducing the amount of time sugars and starches are in the mouth, drinking mm. fluoridated water, and brushing and flossing teeth is the most effective way to reduce dental caries. And yeah. I found it so funny that they use the phrase amount of time sugars are yeah. in the mouth versus consuming sugars. Sugars, yeah. Mm -hmm. But okay, so I remember in um, one of our courses, R taught it. And she said, like, if you have something sugary, have an apple or carrots, like something really crunchy right mm -hmm. after to kind of clean your teeth if you don't have access to a toothbrush. I time. think I was in that class. Yeah. Yeah, I remember her funny. saying that. But that yeah. would reduce the time, I guess, in your mouth. But I mean. But it also kind of promotes like soft drinks. Oh, true. Mm -hmm. Spending very little time in your mouth and not, it's not being chewed. So it's not getting like stuck in your teeth. Yeah. Anyways, I think people keep like bringing this up constantly because they want to make sure that the food industry is being honest and transparent now. Yeah. And by discussing these events publicly, we raise consumer awareness. And I sure. think that the sugar knows this, but they wish us that they could just go and erase history. Yeah, absolutely. Like saying there's no point in dredging up these old um, decisions that were made, but there is a point because people mm -hmm. still... I think quite a few people still feel like fat is making them unhealthy. Mm -hmm. And it yeah. really comes down to the sources. Okay, so I just have a couple of questions about the original sugar study that was released by Harvard. Mm -hmm. First of all, what kind of study was it? Like, was it 
like a high level randomized control trial that was really well conducted? Or was it a systematic literature review of existing lit at the time? Yeah. So they were mainly going through previous literature. So that's okay. That's why the sugar industry kind of, I guess, hired them on. And they gave them some of the literature that they wanted them to review in the study. So oh, it was okay. definitely biased. Interesting. Yes. And some of it as well was done on animals. So some of it wasn't even like human. Which we know is not always often. It rarely translates perfectly to human subjects. Mm -hmm. For sure. I can send you the study later if you want me to. Yeah. Okay. It's very old timey. They use the word man in it a lot. Oh, for humans. Because all studies <laughs> were done on white males. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Sadly true. And then my follow-up question is, how severely were the results skewed or were they so, you know, was there a clear link established between sugar and heart disease and they just left that out like they totally didn't disclose or was there just an inconclusive relationship or no relationship and they just didn't report it? So here's the issue. We actually don't really know Got it. because there was research coming out like linking sugar and heart disease. And so they released this essentially trying to oppose that. The only right. thing that they were able to find were in these communications back and forth was that the sugar industry provided them with some of the research and then the sugar industry was able to review. But they didn't actually find like the results of the actual like lit review or the, the research. Right. All they had was the final product. And because this was the 1960s, it's not like it's, it was documented elsewhere. Right. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Hmm. So it's I guess theoretically it's possible that the sugar industry was checking in, you know, what are, what results have you found so far? And they were just saying, okay, those results look good. Continue. It's also theoretically possible that they were saying, okay, erase those results. That never happened. And let's change these results. So like mm -hmm. the spectrum of what kind of fraud kind of went on here. So to this day, research is still frequently funded by large food industry leaders. Coca-Cola has funded research out of the University of Colorado to focus on exercise rather than caloric intake for optimal weight loss. It was even found in some of their contracts with researchers from 2015 to 2016 that they could quash studies or pressure researchers using the threat of termination. What? Yes. Those were quotes from an article by hmm. this author, Lovelace, that they found in some of the actual contracts with Coca-Cola and researchers. In the contract, they had, we can fire you. Mm -hmm. We can threaten to fire you. We can threaten to fire you. <laughs> okay. Seems like something that shouldn't get signed. And then if you watch the documentary Game Changers, did you, did you watch it? Yeah, I did. Yeah. So you might remember some of the claims that they shared about mm -hmm. avocados. Yeah. And there was one that avocados can modulate the inflammatory response caused by one hamburger meal. Yeah. What wasn't disclosed was that the study was only conducted on 11 people and it was funded by the Haas Avocado Board. So this really does happen all the time. Mm -hmm. And a lot of research wouldn't be possible without industry funding. And there's a large debate as to whether or not this type of research with funding is ethical to the research process since it might lead to biased or falsified results. Right. Some say that it can be used as marketing for the industry and that this research may actually affect the legitimacy and trust of other research that doesn't have industry funding. Yeah. And while some nutrition professionals are very much against it, others seem to be okay with it as long as disclosures are made. Mm-hmm. As sometimes this research can actually lead to like groundbreaking discoveries yeah. and the production of other research down the road. So sometimes it can be really beneficial. Yeah. And I should note too that funding disclosures are now integrated in peer reviewed or credible research. However, mm -hmm. the funder's role, as we were saying before, the funder's role in research is not always specified. So industry funded research should be valued below other public health or nutritional sciences research. Yes. But totally. right now, these types of disclosures, they're not specified in news coverage for the most part. So this might lead to consumer confusion. Mm -hmm. So I think that there needs to just be a bigger push for having an understanding of where this research is coming from, where the things that are being shared in the news are coming from so that it doesn't lead to consumer confusion or consumer deception. Yeah, absolutely. 
I think that mm-hmm. like, so I am, I, if I was reading a study, especially a groundbreaking study, mm-hmm. and it was funded by industry, that would be a major red flag for me, but not a full discount. Like I wouldn't Absolutely. fully be able to be like, I'll, I'll never trust that. I would give it a fair chance, but I would read it with an extra critical eye. Absolutely. And I think too, like one thing that you could do following that is just see if there's any additional research out there that also supports the same finding, Mm -hmm. right? Because sure, the industry may have made that groundbreaking discovery, but Mm -hmm. have other individuals done the similar research and come to similar conclusions? Yeah, it would be so it would be almost impossible, I think, to have to produce a piece of research that has nothing else out there to support it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Absolutely. I think you were ta- you've been talking about like the f- role of the funders, and I've never really considered that that should be disclosed as well. Mm-hmm. And it probably should. Why not disclose that? Yeah, why not? I know. I'd never really thought about it either until I put this together. But it would be very important, especially if a large organization like Coca-Cola is funding it. And mm-hmm. I actually did read... In 26, 2015 or 2016, Coca-Cola made up like they made a new industry rule where mm-hmm. they will only partake in funding. They will only like partake in research funding if they only provide 50% of it. Okay. So there ha- 50% of the funding has to come from elsewhere. And I yeah. think that's to kind of cover their butt. I think they're trying to do better after uh, those things were revealed, yeah, revealed about them. Mhm. Yeah, it's interesting because food industry has so much money. Like if we take that money out of research, I think there's already not enough money in research, right? Mm-hmm. It's already very hard to obtain funding for research that you want to pursue. And one of the major issues, and this has been mentioned in, it was this class, we can bleep her name out, but there's a lot more funding in research when you're going to do something that's a little bit, that is a little bit more groundbreaking. There's less mm-hmm. funding to duplicate studies, which is where a lot of the funding should actually go. It's yeah. not as notable. It's not as important when you duplicate something. Yeah, but it should be. It has such value to have results be duplicated. That's how we mm-hmm. you know, get closer to causation instead mm-hmm. of just correlation. Absolutely. But everybody wants to come out with this like new and hot topic, you know? Yeah. And then, I mean, we're, we're definitely doing an episode on this one day, but the problem is only ex- exacerbated by professors trying to obtain tenure and they have to study a certain amount or so they have to produce a certain amount of kind of novel research versus mm-hmm. just not just replicating studies. It goes mm-hmm. all the way to the top. All the way to the top. <laughs> yeah. All the way to the top. So the moral of the story here is to just question the things that you yeah. hear. Have a critical Check your eye. sources. Yeah, have mm-hmm. a critical eye. Check your sources. See where the funding is coming from, especially when claims seem to go against common knowledge or when they're being used to promote a product. Totally. Cool. That's a wild story. I think it's alarming how insane, how massive the impact on the food industry and people's beliefs about nutrition and trust in nutrition were affected by this one study, this one influenced study. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I grew up in the 90s. I remember all the fat-free stuff. I remember thinking that those were the healthy products. I bought into it for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In university, yeah, that's all. Like I always bought the low-fat dressings. I, yeah, genuinely thought it was healthier, mm-hmm. and it's much less satisfying. That's true. <laughs> it truly is. It truly is. Oh, well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I really did end up enjoying doing all this research and. It is crazy. I I know that this wasn't a crime, but it is crazy to think that this type of scandal, I mean, it went Mm -hmm. on, it still goes on. It's just, it's fascinating, really. Yeah. Well, it might, I mean, I know it wasn't, it wasn't a prosecuted crime, but at the time, if, if they had been caught funding and suppressing research, like, let's say that's what, that's what actually happened. I wonder if that would have been a crime. I don't know. I don't even know if it is today. Yeah, I wonder. Because if you're funding something, you might have a say in how certain methods are conducted. I guess, but that defeats the whole research process. You might, but you'd also probably have a say in what the objective of the study is, right? Because yeah. if you're putting money into something, you would want a say. You would want to know what you're actually looking at, right? Yeah. Totally. Even yeah. if you just helped craft the question that would be influencing research enough. 
That'd be biased. Interesting. Okay. Wow. That was really good. Good job, Becca. Sweet. Thanks, Sarah. (laughs) No problem. (laughs) Okay. So to get you thinking about our next episode, I want to know if you set New Year's resolutions. Mm. So I do. I used to. I actually didn't for 2020, which is probably a good thing. Probably a good thing. (laughs) They would have died on the page. (laughs) Definitely. But uh, I I have a little journal Mm -hmm. that I keep. And every... Like the first of January every year, I'll typically go in and and write a couple of New Year's resolutions. But they are normally things like read 15 books this year or mm-hmm. um, finish your undergrad degree. Yeah, <laughs> which I guess next, for 2021, I'm definitely going to put the master's program on yeah. there. Achievable um, things. Achievable things that I know are either going to happen or not. Mm-hmm. But I love looking back on them and just being like, oh, it's cute that you thought that you were going to do this this year. Or it's great that you accomplished this this year. Yeah. Um, I really, really like looking back on them once the year is done. Yeah, totally. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's amazing. I actually always on New Year's Eve write down everything I can remember that I did in the, the year that's ending. And it's just cool to be like, wow, I did all that in 12 months. That's that is great. Yeah, I like that. It's fun. It's like usually I can fill a whole page and sometimes it's just like uh, took this road trip, you know, started a new program, took this whatever. But it ends up being a lot of things. I'll just like Mm -hmm. go back through my Google Cal and think, oh, yeah, I did that, too. Oh, yeah. This year you'll just be listing off all the Netflix shows I've been telling you to watch. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. No, that'll be my my New Year's resolutions will be catch up on, on all the Netflix and other shows that I haven't watched yet. But this year I'll be able to say I started two podcasts. That's true. That's massive. Yeah, that's and massive. started a master's program. And started a master's. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But in terms of resolutions, I don't. Yeah. So I definitely write out some resolutions of things I want to like accomplish or work on. But I just love goal setting. I think I do it like Mm -hmm. once a month. Wow, you do. Not formally. Like I don't sit down and do it, but I'm always like, ooh, these are the things I want to do. Okay. Always. And so like the new start of the new year is it feels new and it feels fresh. So I'll absolutely set some resolutions like, oh gosh, what will I do? I don't know. Prioritize sleep. Something Mm -hmm. like that. Like a a greater goal for the year. (gasps) Yeah, that's so cute. Cool. Well, okay. Thanks for listening. Yeah. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode and check out Extra Cheese. Yeah. We think you'll like it. We think you'll like it. And also if you're listening and you're like, hmm, this is pretty good, but we it could use some of this. Just let us know. Yeah, please do. Send us an email. We're workshopping it. Yes. Give us some feedback. Also leave us a nice review. That'd be nice. That'd be so nice. <laughs> we really like doing this podcast and reading reviews is so exciting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It feels like it's all paying off. Just seeing that people are listening and loving it. It's amazing. Absolutely. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Dietetics After Dark. You can find all the references and materials used to put this podcast together in our show notes at thenutritionjunkie.com slash dietetics This is an independently produced podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, we would love it if you would rate, review, and subscribe to our show. For more information, follow us on Instagram at Dietetics After Dark. If you have an idea for an episode or segment, email us at dietheticsafterdark at gmail.com. This podcast was recorded and edited by Earworm Radio. We highly recommend their services for all of your podcasting needs. You can learn more about Earworm Radio at earwormradio.com.